The Lockheed U-2 Dragon Lady, an iconic high-altitude reconnaissance aircraft that served the United States Air Force since 1955, presents one of aviation's most unusual operational requirements. It cannot land safety without help from the ground. Every time this legendary spy plane touches down, it requires a specially designated chase car racing behind it at speeds exceeding 100 miles per hour driven by another U-2 pilot who serves as the airborne pilot's eyes during the critical final moments of landing. This extraordinary procedure exists because of fundamental design choices that made the U-2 exceptional at its primary mission, flying at extreme altitudes for extended periods, while simultaneously making it one of the most challenging aircraft in the world to land. The Design That Demands Chase Cars The U-2's unique landing requirements stem directly from the aircraft's radical engineering. Designed by Lockheed's legendary Skunk Works division, the U-2 was built with a singular focus, reaching altitudes of 70,000 feet while carrying sophisticated reconnaissance equipment over distances exceeding 7,000 miles. To achieve this performance, Engineers made the U-2 as light as possible, designing it like a powered glider with long, unswept wings spanning 104 feet and a pencil-thin fuselage. The weight savings from this unusual landing gear arrangement are substantial. By eliminating traditional gear bays and the associated structural support, designers reduced the U-2's gross weight considerably allowing it to carry more fuel and equipment to extreme altitudes. However, this design choice created a landing challenge that has persisted for seven decades. The Visibility Problem Beyond the unconventional landing gear, the U-2 presents another critical problem during landing – severely restricted visibility. U-2 pilots must wear full-pressure suits to survive at altitudes where, without protection, human blood and bodily fluids would boil. At operating altitudes above 63,000 feet, cabin pressurization alone is insufficient, necessitating specialized S-1034 suits that cost approximately $250,000 each. The U-2's cockpit design further compounds visibility issues. The aircraft's 104-foot wingspan generates tremendous lift, and the long nose blocks much of the pilot's forward and downward view. After flying missions lasting 9 to 10 hours at extreme altitudes, exhausted pilots in bulky suits must somehow execute a precision landing in an aircraft where they can barely see the runway. The Stalling Requirement Landing a U-2 isn't simply a matter of touching down on a runway. It requires deliberately stalling the aircraft just feet above the ground. This counterintuitive procedure exists because the U-2's high-lift wings generate so much lift, particularly in ground effect, that the aircraft refuses to land unless fully stalled. The cushion of air created by these wings is so pronounced that attempting to fly the aircraft onto the runway results in bouncing and floating that can consume the entire runway's length. The landing procedure demands that pilots descend to exactly two feet above the runway, hold that altitude while bleeding off airspeed, then initiate a complete stall that causes the aircraft to drop onto its tailwheel. If the pilot stalls from more than three to four feet, the landing gear cannot absorb the impact, potentially causing structural damage to the fragile airframe and breaking sensitive sensors. As U-2 pilot Major Steve Randall explained, if you stall from more than about three feet, there's a great possibility of incurring structural damage. 
The precision required is extraordinary. Pilots must arrive over the runway threshold at a calculated T speed, typically about 10 knots above stalling speed based on the aircraft's empty weight, plus one knot for every 100 gallons of remaining fuel. Every knot above the correct speed adds approximately 1,000 feet to the landing distance. At 10 knots fast, the aircraft will float at 2 feet above the runway for its entire length. This narrow margin for error exists because, at altitude, the U-2 operates in Coffin Corner, where only 5 knots separate Stall Buffet from Bach Buffet. The same aerodynamic characteristics that enable high-altitude flight make low-altitude operations exceptionally demanding, requiring constant, precise control inputs to maintain the proper descent rate and attitude. The Mobile Officer's Critical Role Enter the Mobile Officer, the official designation for the U-2 pilot who drives the chase car. This isn't simply a ground crew member with a radio, it's another fully qualified U-2 pilot who understands exactly what the airborne pilot is experiencing and what instructions will help most. As one mobile officer explained, you're the eyes of the pilot, visibility is poor. As the mobile, you act as the co-pilot from the car. The mobile officer's duties begin long before the aircraft touches down. During pre-flight operations, the mobile observes the entire startup sequence, watching for safety issues and ensuring ground crew members are clear before the aircraft taxis. Once the U-2 reaches the runway, the mobile performs a final safety sweep, removes the pins that secure the pogo wheels in place, and removes the pilot's ejection seat safety pins. As the aircraft begins its takeoff roll, the mobile watches to ensure both pogo wheels fall away cleanly, alerting the pilot if one becomes stuck. During landing, the mobile officer must accelerate from zero to match the U-2's approach speed, often close to 100 miles per hour, in whatever runway distance is available, then drop into position 50 to 75 feet directly behind the aircraft. From this vantage point, using visual references between the aircraft and the horizon, the mobile begins calling out critical information the moment the aircraft descends through 10 feet. The radio calls are rapid and scientific, altitude in feet, and eventually inches. Alignment with the runway centerline, wing level status, and required control inputs. The mobile officer might call right rudder or left rudder to help the pilot align the nose with the runway, or tails up at two to indicate the aircraft still has energy and needs careful handling to avoid bouncing. As the aircraft approaches the critical two-foot altitude, calls become more frequent and precise, guiding the pilot through the delicate balance of maintaining height while bleeding off speed. On windy days with rough air, the mobile officer becomes extraordinarily busy, helping the pilot manage what amounts to riding a 40,000-pound bicycle down the runway. Crosswinds can cause the aircraft to crab sideways, requiring constant rudder corrections that the mobile officer guides based on what they can see that the pilot cannot. <laughs>